Good evening and welcome to the October 26th uh, virtual Beaverton School Board business meeting. We welcome you all here this evening. We will start off this evening by calling roll of our school board members. If you could just uh, signify by saying here, uh, appreciate it. Ann Bryan. Here. Donna Tyner. Donna is excused this evening. Eric Simpson. Here. Leanne Larson. Leanne, I, I just saw her. You're on mute, Leanne. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next. Susan Greenberg. Here. And Tom Collette. Here. And Becky Timchuk. Here. All right, we'll call this meeting to order. Uh, board members, are there any changes to tonight's agenda? All right. We'll move on to the next order of business. We have we'll welcome our guests this evening. Um, with us this evening is the president of the Beaverton Education Association, Sarah Schmidt. Sarah, would you like to um, have a few words with us this evening? Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening, Superintendent Grotting, Chair Tim Chuck, and members of the board. Um, last week, I had the privilege of attending a roundtable discussion with Congresswoman Bonamici and a few of her staff members, along with 15 BEA members. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about it because it was a very powerful experience. Um, we, have, we had educators there who serve BSD students in many capacities. We had um, a few classroom teachers, a few counselors, a social worker, several ELD teachers, some dual language teachers, a couple resource room teachers and a student manager. Um, and the conversation was completely centered around the broad and deep needs of our students and their families during this pandemic, how our systems have been, despite how hard we're trying, um, failing to provide all of the critical support that students and families need and how challenging this year has been for educators. Um, a few of the things that folks talked about with the Congresswoman were internet ban bandwidth and connectivity issues um, that students are having challenges with getting meals to students, communicating with the parents and families of our emerging bilingual students, um, challenging access to language interpreters that we need to communicate with families, the social and emotional needs of students, um, reduced student engagement at the middle and high school level because our older students are caring for younger siblings, sometimes holding younger uh, siblings on their lap as they are engaging in their Zoom classes. And um, the crushing pressure that students are feeling because they're being assessed and graded um, right now, even though they're up against barriers that are out of their control. Um, and what really struck me in this conversation was the deep passion and care um, that our educators showed for their students and how creative folks have been trying to be um, in working with colleagues to provide wraparound services to students um, and are just doing the best they can. Um, the conversation then turned to uh, what happens next and how we move forward. And it was clear that ending the pandemic is the obvious primary goal. Um, educators talked about needing rapid COVID testing, um, contact tracing protocols, um, school buildings with proper ventilation and air filtration and a lot of things that we all think of and kind of hear the dollar signs. <laughs> um, and then teachers talked about the challenges of um, doing their work um, as students come back um, and trying to do um, education while keeping proper physical distancing and just everyone's fears of potentially exposing students and their families to COVID. So all of this is to say, um, I hope these concerns are not news to you, but um, at times it's evident that the, the individual stories from our students and educators aren't always being elevated and that these decisions, um, these voices are really critical in decision-making and really they should be at the very center of decision-making. Um, so I just wanna encourage you all um, as you're engaging in your work to make sure that we are always creating open communication with our community, um, including students and parents and also educators so that we're making decisions with our community and not for our community. Um, I also wanna take every opportunity I can to say that um, educators are heroes and that BSD staff, um, both certified and classified, 
show incredible empathy, compassion, dedication, professionalism, creativity, joy, um, and just real um, dedication to students every day. Um, as such, I talked about last month um, how worn out folks are. Um, for all the reasons that I just described, doing all of those things are um, exhausting. So I'm looking forward to hearing tonight about um, how the immense workload on the shoulders of educators is being addressed and what support is being provided for the well being of staff. We obviously are all um, wanting great results for students, but we can't get there if we aren't taking care of the educators who are on the front lines. So thank you all for your work. Um, Please remember everyone to participate in your civic duty to vote. We have one more week. Get your ballots in ASAP. And thank you for the time to speak this evening. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your comments. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the work um, for our staff and, and you representing um, our teachers this evening. Um, with that, we have um, public comment. We had public comment open last week and we closed it at noon today. We heard from 47 members of uh, our community who provided public testimony. The public testimony has been provided to the board. It will be in, in our minutes and it will be part of our public record. Um, and looking over um, the comments, um, we have a, a gr very wide group of perspectives from our community and you would think in a community our size we would have many different perspectives um, and different things we heard from one student um, who wants us to look at our ap independent studies credit um, feels like we're not giving proper credit for uh, independent studies and and uh, very concerned uh, about that we also heard from um, several uh, students and parents about when we will be able to maybe look at offering uh, athletics again, since some of our neighboring school districts are starting um, with that. Um, we have um, family members that are uh, concerned about our, the protocols and the safety of returning to schools, uh, whether that be limited or, or full time. Um, well, we had um, a community member that had some questions about um, some our new uh, things that we're doing with our social studies curriculum. Um, we also had um, some of our staff uh, comment on the survey that went out and, and the things that we're doing with uh, comprehensive distance learning and limited in-person instruction and, and taking safety into call. And then we also had staff members that are very concerned that some of our students are maybe not getting um, all of the services that, that, that they need and they're uh, con concerned about that. Um, so as you can see, there's uh, lots of perspectives and uh, we will be um, commenting back to our um, folks that wrote into us. And we thank you very much for taking the time to share your thoughts and perspective with the, with the school board. With that, we're going to go into reports. And first up is we'll be hearing from our uh, Superintendent Gray. Thank you, Chair Tim Chuck and uh, members of the board. Um, I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about uh, our comprehensive distance learning, limited in-person instruction and return to school planning as you heard from President Schmidt and you know, a lot of our community members, it's uh, I think foremost on their mind. And as of late, it, there has been a lot of discussion at the state level to include discussions with our governor, Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Education. So. Starting off with that, uh, the safety of our and well being, long term well being of our students and staff uh, continues to be our priority. Uh, our, our district remains in comprehensive distance learning. And as you know, we've announced it will continue in that status until the end of the first semester, unless the metrics. Um, are either adjusted by the governor and or we would see a significant turnaround to allow us to go back to school in the current metrics. Um, there has been a recent dialogue, as I said, with the Department of Education, OHA and the governor, uh, a group of super superintendents met with the governor on Thursday and um, she indicated along with the Department of Education that there will probably be a change in the metrics that govern school districts in Oregon. Um, everybody wants to know what the timing of that looks like. Uh, I was able to uh, talk with uh, Department of Education uh, 
today and it could be as early as the end of this week and or as late as uh, two to three weeks out. I think they're trying to look at all the different variables. They're trying to get it right. And it's a complex issue um, going in there. But it's very important to us as we need to prepare for uh, school blueprints and all of these different scenarios. Uh, the other thing that was brought up with the governor and um, all of those other stakeholders has to do with the current metrics that we are under as, as it regards to social distancing. As you know, um, when we're looking at either coming back in a hybrid or limited in-person instruction, there are some social distancing requirements that could actually cause some of our students to see, receive less instruction or less services if they came back in a limited in-person instruction. And we shared a lot of those variables uh, with the governor all the way from the two hour limitation that students can be there and they cannot be there when they're receiving their instruction online, the limiting amount of cohorts that students can be in and everything from uh, transportation issues that uh, would restrict us from some of the things that we want to do with um, students. Want to let the board know and our community know that we have teams working at looking at several different scenarios and we have to be prepared to pivot and uh, we are in that process right now. Um, we talked about, I think the chair mentioned, we've had lots of interest on how students can start engaging in activities and athletics. And we also have a team of folks looking at that. They're working with Josh Gomez, our operations director. And there is a good chance that we will be possibly being able to come back in some sort of fashion as long as it's done in a safe manner and there's accountability regarding athletics and activities. Uh, as long as we can provide social distancing guidelines that are approved by the Oregon Health Authority, the Department of Education and OSAA when it comes to athletics. Tonight you're going to hear later on about um, our metrics as we return to school. Um, we continue to monitor our COVID-19 data in Washington and Multnomah counties. Uh, the data, to be honest, is continues to go the wrong way. It continues to excel. Um, and we will continue in comprehensive distance learning until we either meet the current metrics or changing metrics, and we can do that safely. Um, as I said recently, the data has been moving in the wrong directions. We're going to be looking at those new metrics. And, um, but right now, as of right now, we plan on being in comprehensive distance learning um, through the end of the first semester. And one of the reasons is this allows our students, family, and staff time to prepare and adjust. We continue to offer small group instruction for evaluation assessment. And we also uh, are looking at the possibility of being able to offer, whether it's an internet uh, kind of cafe for those students who either cannot get connectivity and or they're in an environment to where they cannot participate um, adequately in their comprehensive distance learning. We also shared that with the governor as well as some of those other limiting factors requirements around uh, bringing folks back in limited in-person instruction. One of the things that I know the Department of Education is looking at, and for those community members are out there, definitely board members and other staff members, some of the different systems that they're looking at right now is uh, systems that's been initiated in Rhode Island and New York. And um, I know that uh, if you look at those systems, they have some accountability measures um, baked into them regarding uh, an, almost like an oversight committee for schools regarding are they adhering to the social distancing uh, requirements and regulations and looking at that. And then also there's some data in there about the transmission from student to student. 
but also we know those students go home and they're interacting with families. But if you want to see where possibly we may be heading, look at what's happening in Rhode Island and New York. And also I would suggest looking at the uh, state of Washington school metrics. Once again, nothing official has come out, uh, but I believe that we will be seeing something in the near future um, regarding that. And once again, you'll hear from, you'll hear from uh, later on from uh, our, some of our teaching and learning folks regarding the metrics and plans. The next thing I wanna to talk to a little bit is regarding our staffing enrollment and finances in Beaverton, like other school districts in Oregon are experiencing significant declines in enrollment due to COVID-19. At this time, uh, the Beaverton School District, we are estimating a drop somewhere around 1,700 students. The majority of this decline is at the elementary level with a significant decline in kindergarten. Uh, due to unanticipated enrollment declines, we are currently staffed above our staffing allocation model. Our current estimation, and once again, I wanna say this is an estimation, it's changing all the time. Uh, we're probably reflecting somewhere around a $9 million deficit. Although school districts are allocated ADM funding on the highest two current years, the district eventually will have to balance its revenues and expenditures um, considering enrollment. And remember that some of these schools are, are students that are leaving our schools are going into charter schools, uh, online schools, and this is causing the pie to be sliced a lot thinner. So uh, although some folks could say, well, if there's less students in schools, uh, we could continue to receive the same amount of funding but remember that uh, the pie is going to be sliced in more pieces and uh, there will be revenue going to our charter schools, online schools. Um, and so that, that will take a toll on us. Um, and although we are deficit spending, uh, we did make and uh, thank the school board for um, in, in my individual talks, uh, the district will not be doing at this time at this time, mid-year layoffs. Uh, we just feel it, it is too disruptive to the system uh, right now. Uh, we know that as uh, President Smith said, teachers are working as hard as they can, parents are working as hard as they can, and our students are working hard as they can. And to break up some of those relationships that have been built between students, teachers, and parents right now uh, is not the thing to do but also want to be absolutely uh, clear that we will be planning for reduced staffing for the next school year if our enrollment is not restored. So wanna make that uh, perfectly clear. We're trying to look at other strategies and tightening our belts right now um, to, to offset some of that nine million, expected $9 million deficit. And finally, I just wanna end on a real positive note and thank some people. Uh, we continue to work with our county, other school districts in Washington County, and we will be providing uh, childcare subsistence. Funds are available. We are communicating to our families regarding how they can access these funding for past, uh, past and future childcare delivered by licensed childcare providers. I wanna thank uh, Deputy Superintendent Mead, uh, uh, Mr. Sparks, uh, our communications director, Shelly, uh, for all the great work they're doing. Um, our communication director was on um, in with several media outlets today doing interviews, getting the word out. And it was evident that a lot of these uh, outlets had not heard about this. And so they're helping us get the word out. Uh, I think our schools are doing a great job we're training our secretaries. So when they get those calls there that we have factual information and the secretaries will be able to provide, whether it's through um, the internet uh, and or we're also doing paper copies for families and getting that word out. And so far the response has really been good. Uh, there are some limiting factors. Uh, as, as I said before, it has to be a licensed childcare provider but they can go back and be a re reimbursed back to um, August 1st. So that's exciting that we could possibly be, be providing some subsistence for some of our 
uh, most impacted families, as well as I know our business department has been working with uh, folks to try to figure out how we can also try to upfront prepay as long as they can bring us in a receipt. We can work with our daycare providers and um, other licensed providers to be able to allow parents to engage in this who may not have be able to front that upfront money. So uh, just a lot of work's been going on in a very short time. So congratulations to all those folks. That's all I have, Chair. Uh, Chair. Thank you, muted Beck. There we go. Um, thank you very much for that report. Board members, do you have any questions of the superintendent? All right, thank you so much. Lots of information coming down very fast. So thank you for keeping, keeping us up to date. Uh, next report um, is on Division 22 compliance and assurances from John Bridges. Thank you, Chair. Tim Chuck, members of the board, superintendent. Uh, you're seeing me earlier than usual, as you saw in the situation page that uh, the Oregon Department of Education has moved the timeline for districts to report on their compliance with Division 22 assurances from February back to November 15th. So here we are, and I am happy to report that the district is in compliance with all 17 standards that were in effect for the 1920 school year. The number of standards was narrowed by the state board in response to the pandemic. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions from the board. Board members, any questions from Dr. Bridges? I just have one, Becky. Um, uh, with uh, the ongoing health situation and many schools continuing to be in comprehensive distance learning, are we getting ongoing guidance from the Department of Education about what standards will be held to as we move forward? Will 2021, will this school year be similar to last and, and what other things are we hearing that will be expected to do? Thank you, that's a great question. And we're anticipating that all the standards that were in effect for the 2018-19 school year will be in effect for this school year with a couple of exceptions. Uh, the department, I think, is adding a rule and doing some tweaks to a couple others, but it will not be the pared down 17 standards that we saw this year. Any other questions? I had, I had the same, same thought, Anne. <laughs> I guess I just have one follow-up then, you know, uh, do we expect to be in compliance? <laughs> <laughs> I am working on the instructional time calculation right now. Um, I believe, I can't think of any right now that are gonna give us difficulty, but I haven't actually dug in to the standards that are in effect for this year. I probably won't do that until after the first of the year. I have a follow up on that too. If we were to go into hybrid, would that reduce the number of minutes of instruction our students are getting from where they're at now? So Tom, that's also an excellent question. What the department did for the instructional time is that they've held the line on the number of hours that students are to receive instruction, but they've provided additional flexibility for districts in terms of what counts for instructional time. So there's more professional development time under the rule that was in effect for the 18-19 school year it was the board could uh, authorize the inclusion of 30 hours of professional development as instructional time. The Department of Education, the state board increased that to 90 hours for this school year. And the same, they also have allowed districts to count up to 60 hours of student family connection time as instructional time. So I'm gonna try and do a calculation relatively soon on where we are at the instructional time for the first semester and then see how we're operating second semester and do that calculation. Thank you. All right, any other questions on the 22? Assurances. We appreciate that report and you can stay right where you are, Dr. Bridges, and um, <laughs> roll right into the um, SIA grant agreement. 
Thank you, Chair Timchuk. As you recall, we applied for a student investment account grant in the spring and you authorized that application. And now we're at the step of receiving funds, which also needs your authorization. Unfortunately, the plan that we wrote for 32 million is only funded at about a third that amount or $10 million. So under the department's rules, districts that are reducing or continuing with their plan but reducing the scope of activities that are funded don't need to revise their plan. Um, we just need to let the department know how we're gonna spend that $10 million that we did receive. So we don't need to revise our plan. Um, I'm, and Mike can jump in here as well, but we're really funding four areas with this reduction of two thirds of funding. Uh, 4.4 million for a class size reduction based on uh, the poverty level in the school. So an additional weight for students from families that are economically disadvantaged. That 4.4 million is about two thirds of the 6.8 million that we had budgeted. A second area is for class size reduction at the early grades in grades K through two. Uh, we're funding $2.3 million for reduced class sizes in those grades and we had budgeted 4.3 million. The third area at $10 million just doesn't go as far as it did back in the day, I guess. The third area is for behavioral health and wellness, our student success team. So that's um, hiring more social workers, increasing counselors, increasing services to students with disabilities, as well as health services at the district level. We had budgeted 15.6 million in our original application and we're funding 3.5 million, so about 20%. And then we have a little dab left. We did not wanna leave uh, equity untouched. We had budgeted 267,000 for recruitment and retention initiatives for staff of color and we've allocated the last $160,000 of our SIA funds to support those efforts. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from the board on the grant agreement that the state has provided for us. Any questions, board members? We're, we're sorry that we're not getting that full amount, but we're appreciative of what we are getting and that it can make our difference to our most vulnerable students. Um, I, I will ask real quickly, when we uh, talked about the social worker and I, and I saw when we were uh, welcoming new employees, there were a lot of new faces that are social workers uh, in our district and that was great to see. Is there uh, a certain um, uh, focus that these social workers are providing? Is it a certain kind of social work? Uh, is it community wraparound services or, or, or is that something that's not in your, in your wheelhouse, Dr. Bridges? That's not in my wheelhouse, Chair Tim Chuck. Sorry. All right. Well, we'll ask uh, we'll ask Danielle the next time we get a chance. So, but thank you, Chair. I, I have just Ann one question. Uh, uh, I'm curious as you know. I know at this time uh, last year we were starting a very rich community engagement process, and we were uh, assured we would be doing this every year. And then a pandemic hit, um, and so I'm curious as I, and very supportive about our plan, um, but I'm also curious about what uh, community engagement requirements there are as we move forward with this new uh, law and requirements. Uh, what has changed, if anything, what we expect to see in terms of engagement with our community? Thanks, Ann, that's a great question. I could answer that. Um, I wonder if Leanne or Susan would like to weigh in. We had just have our first planning meeting around the next revision of the SIA grant application last week. And that was one of the topics of discussion. So I'll defer to them if they would like to answer that question and share what we're thinking right now after this first initial meeting. So say I wasn't able to attend, John. Oh, sorry. Leanne, are you on and available and comfort talking about that? No, nope. okay, I guess the ball's in my court. Um, so <laughs> uh, that is a question that we have and David's continuing to press the Department of Education 
around what are the requirements for districts in this next phase because we really weren't able to lift our grant application off the ground as we envisioned because of the pandemic and the reduced funding. At the same time, we talked about, we have a, a obligation to re-engage those community groups that gave us feedback, update them and let them know how we're spending the SIA funds that we do have and ask them based on the experience of students and families over the last six months is our uh, activities that we compiled, are those still the needs of the district? So I think we're not really, uh, not sure of the value add of a complete full blown engagement process as we did before, but we also made a commitment to the groups that gave us feedback that we would continue to engage with them. So we do want to hold ourselves accountable, share with those groups what we've been doing and ask for additional feedback so that we can make revisions before the next submission is due, but no firm guidance yet. And, and this, is, this is Don and I think uh, John put that well. So Scott and I and the Associate Superintendent at the Department of Education uh, you know, in this time, several districts have lobbied to saying, you know, um, it, considering these times to just do away with that process. And I think he and the Department of Education have been pretty adamant that the entire process will not be done away with. There may be some flexibility in the process, but the process still needs to exist in some fashion. All right, any other questions for Dr. Bridges? Yeah, okay. I have a question about funding and looking into the future here. Um, I know we're starting to get like some big picture sense of what we may be looking at over the next biennium. Has that included any information about SEI, SIA funds and um, what they may look like in the coming biennium? Mike, do you want to jump in and address that? Or Happy to, maybe? Tom. Yeah, uh, the last forecast we got, the collections were a little bit stronger than initially anticipated, um, but not, you know, not awesome, right? So we'll keep our eye on that. Uh, the next forecast is November 18th, and we'll be able, that's when we'll get our next picture of it, and I'll send something out so you got an idea. Okay, appreciate it. All right, any other? Well, we appreciate the update. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we will be following the Student Investment Act very closely uh, as the year progresses here and the legislature meets next year. So thank you very much for that update. Next up, um, much anticipated enrollment update. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Carl Mead. Good evening, Chair and Board. Nice to see everyone this evening. Um, as you receive your report, uh, rather lengthy report, so you could slice and dice this data many, many different ways. Uh, I just want to hit a couple of highlights for you this evening. Um, as Don shared with you, we are well over 1,600 students down where uh, our projection was for this year coming into this year. Specifically at the elementary level, we're down by 1,300, a little over 1,300 students. 328 middle schoolers, but up at the high school by 53 students. That information is on page one of your report. On page two, it highlights our homeschool registrations. We are up well over 400 registrations as compared to years past. We have typically hovered around in the 200s, I would say mid 200s for homeschool. The fact that we're up to six, uh, 654, it's a factor of COVID-19, and I don't think any of us are surprised by that. Um, of those numbers at the homeschool level, 481 of those are students at the elementary level, 91 at the middle school, and 23 at the high school level. On page four um, of your document, it outlines uh, very specifically the charter school registrations and our students um, that are attending those schools. So you can see the numbers very specifically. That accounts for a little over um, 1155 in terms of students um, overall there. 
The next portion of this report, pages five, six, and seven, gets pretty specific into the schools. You'll see that most schools had double digit decreases, decreases in student enrollment across the board. There are a few exceptions to that. We had a couple of schools with increases. Sato increased by two students, but the Loa High School, Southridge High School, ACMA, and ISB also saw increases in student enrollment. But unfortunately, all of our other schools, significant drops across the board. As you go further into this document, uh, pages eight, nine, and 10, this is our, I wanna just highlight the flex enrollment here. That's the pink band across the bottom for you. Uh, it gives you this very specific numbers of where we're at in the breakout of our flex enrollment. So an example of that at kindergarten, we have 73 students attending and a total of K through five at 661 at um, the middle level 319 and at the high school 234 students. Continuing on in this report, um, pages 15 through 17, that gives you very specifically um, the breakdown by school of flex students that are attending. So you can see the school that they previously attended um, and, or I should say that is there an enrollment area or catchment area, um, but they are choosing to attend uh, flex online. The document continues with our SPED program as we've seen in the past pages 18 through 20. And then page 22 is accuracy of projections. We expected us to be accurate once COVID-19 hit this year, but you can see how far off we were from those projections from the projections of last year to this year. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. From board members. I've got a question. Right. Carl? From where these numbers were um, on September 30th to where we are now, what kind of a change are you seeing? Actually, our change is draw, it slowed pretty significantly. We saw the biggest drop um, coming into, I would say the first week in September, um, the start of the school year. And I would say probably within the first week of actual school happening was where our largest drops were occurring. Yeah. By that point in time, Things had stabilized for the most part across the board. Again, you're always going to have a couple of factors here and there, but not like what we were seeing in August. Are we increasing any areas as we do outreach to the community or is it basically flat? I would say we're remaining pretty flat across the board at this time. Uh, that will change if we become, if we go back to in-person, if we do limited person, in-person instruction, number of factors at play here. Um, we're potentially looking at and, um, taking a look at where we're going with our flex online, not necessarily for this year, but as we roll forward into next year, what is our capacity of growing that program? That may be an attraction for families who have chosen to enroll in charter schools outside of our district. Carl, I had a question about those uh, online charter schools, the students choosing to go outside of our district. I wasn't sure how those numbers compared to the previous year. Yeah. You know, it's definitely a sizable group you know, uh, slightly more than a thousand students. I just wasn't sure how that compared. I, I, I'm going from memory here, but I will go and I will have to get the information from our teaching learning department. I believe we've grown probably by about 600 students in students who have exited into charters. Any, any other questions? Uh, I know you probably don't know, but is this, have we compared ourselves to Salem or Portland? Is that the same anymore? We've not asked them for their specific numbers. Um, I think we're all just kind of waiting for the dust to settle a little bit, and then we'll get some specifics on that. And I'm happy to do some reaching out to those districts, and I can send that information to the board in the coming weeks. Well, it certainly was interesting. There is a lot variety and choices and families are making all sorts of different choices for what works for their family. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting to, to see the, the, those demographics. So thank you for that very so close report. I have a question about, the, I don't know if this, as things change, can we reach out to those families that have chosen to go outside of the district um, for their kids' education? That's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> question would be is would a family if they chose to go outside of us and they're at a charter 
they would probably most likely want to go into our flex program at this point in time. The reality is we are already, as you heard Don in his opening comments, down by approximately $9 million. So we don't have resources to add to that online flex program at this time. So that would be a conversation that we would want to engage in in the future months in planning for next year. If, if I can kick in a little bit, Susan, uh, we're doing academic conferences with all of our principals right now. So we're asking them specifically, what are some of the things that they're doing? And all of our principals are reaching out to uh, those families, families that have not enrolled, families that are homeschooled, and families that are in their own, our own flex program, as well as trying to reach out to previous students that they have, trying to encourage them to come back. Uh, they will get some that come back. Uh, one particular principal just said, I, I, I just got uh, two back and three more left the same day. Um, and they're just making some decisions uh, based on uh, some of it's around safety. I think some of it's around economics. And then we just have some families that are moving out of the moving out of uh, Beaverton due to maybe uh, parents uh, losing their jobs or or finding jobs elsewhere. But uh, I think that some of the layoffs in in uh, specifically to Beaverton have been responsible for some of these families moving. Yeah, well, I have a follow up question to, to Carl's response about flex. So, I mean, I don't know how many families would say, oh, I wanna go to flex, but we'd actually have to turn them away and not take them back because we don't have the capacity in terms of economic capacity. That saddens me. <laughs> Well, part of that is, is that based on our decision at this time, we were, in fact, we were reducing teachers that are currently assigned to school. That would be something we would be able to shift staffing into flex. We've made that decision to not do that. So those resources are already dispersed throughout the district. So we don't have, um, Michael, I, I keep trying to ask Mike for that pot of gold, um, and it's just nothing coming forward. So it's a matter of where would that resource come from? Um, and right now, we just got to take a look and be very cautious about the expenses at the present time. Susan, you do bring up a very interesting um, uh, dilemma, though, uh, as if these metrics change and we do come back and we're going to have to consider, uh, you know, what are families going to want to do? Are they going to want to stay in a comprehensive distance learning system or will they go to flex? I think parents like that option. However, uh, I think our teachers are working about as hard as they can and then to ask them to uh, do in-person and then at the same time engage in distance learning is gonna be a, would be a, a real challenge. So we're looking at uh, what would we need to expand flex without adding additional resources. And the only way you can really do that is to shift staffing from our schools into flex if there is that need to meet the to meet the needs of the community which would cause some volatility with uh, current schools current classrooms but what i can tell you is we don't have the additional resources to go out and hire more teachers to to uh to fulfill the to fulfill the need i mean you heard we're $9 million upside down now. We just, that, that would be impossible. And my CFO would probably jump off a cliff. So Susan, one of the pieces that we will continue to, I apologize this evening. Is, my, is the volume working better? All right. A little bit. It's a lot of background mm -hmm. noise, Carl. <clears throat> that may be my paper shuffling too, though. Maybe that's a bit. Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I need a bigger desktop right here. Um, Susan, one of the other pieces we're going to be doing and monitoring over the course of this year is our flex as our flex program. If there's movement out, that may create space for us to be able to accept students into that program. Um, again, unknowns. Uh, families will continue to move, make decisions for themselves, and everything else. So we'll continue to monitor. I guess that's why we call it flex because <laughs> you need flexibility. Okay. We'll run with that. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on enrollment? I'm sure we'll get 
further updates. Thank you very much for that. All right, now the man with all the answers. Um, a financial update from Associate Superintendent Schofield. Thank you, Chair Tim Chuck, members of the board. Appreciate the opportunity. And um, I will tell you just anecdotally, I, I have talked to some of our neighbors. They're in the same uh, general percentage of reduction of students as we are. There are a couple outliers where those numbers are a little higher, um, but I can help uh, uh, Carl get those numbers for you so you can take a look. Uh, interesting to see. Uh, you have the general fund activity and forecast uh, in front of you today as part of the financial packet, our summary of revenue expenditures uh, outside of the general fund, the classroom teacher allocation as of 930, our portfolio management and summary, investments by sector and group, and selected funds by summary issue or the, the standard issue packet you get each month. Uh, I know we spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, going through the numbers in our last meeting. I won't take as much time during this meeting. I will tell you that uh, the ending fund balance uh, is bumped up um, to just under $69 million. That's primarily due to some further evaluation based on what we saw at the start of school and through the first entire month of December, as well as what we've seen in October. So uh, we are not spending as much in the areas of salary and benefits uh, as, as you could probably expect. Um, but again, that number is a number uh, where it is today based on what conditions look like today. Uh, we have plenty of opportunity for that to change. We are in bargaining uh, with BEA uh, over economics. As you heard from BE President Schmidt, uh, there are going to be lots of opportunities for dollars as the metrics change and we look at um, you know, how we get kids back, what kind of protocols are in place and what needs we have out there. So stay tuned to that number. Um, it, it, it will likely change. This isn't one of those years where we set that number and it just goes up or down a million or two here or there. Uh, I think there could be some real swings in that number. Um, so I won't take much more time on that. Uh, if you have questions, happy to answer them, but uh, that's where we sit today. Okay. Anybody have any questions on the current financials? It's, it's good to see that we're, we're trying to save where we can and, and put it away for when we know it's coming down the road. Um, you know, I, I, it's still tough to see some of our um, personnel that we were, we're furloughing um, and still trying, you know, to do the job. And I know, I know that's a delicate balance uh, because we want to be able to get them back to full time and have the resources to do that. Um, but uh, just want how much we appreciate um, the people, our staff that are making the sacrifices to uh, right now so that we can keep the district uh, afloat and, and still doing their jobs. So we, we very much appreciate that. And, and um, so uh, next up is uh, our uh, bond or uh, budget committee update. Thank you. Uh, as you know, we have two openings uh, for the budget committee. Uh, as of today, we have uh, one applicant in each zone. So uh, based on some discussion last week, we decided to the, extend the um, application period by one week. So it will close at the end of this week. And uh, I spoke with uh, Shelly earlier, and we're going to push that out and make sure folks know. Um, you can see what's required there, a letter of interest and resume, um, and that uh, you individual board members will review applications and have discussions with folks. Um, and again, we extended the deadline to the end of the week. We still think we can meet our deadline of presenting uh, uh, candidates to you at the November 30th board meeting. So just an update. And Mike, you wanna just remind us what uh, two openings we have right now, in case we have some folks out there watching us right now that would really like to join our budget committee. Sure, zones one and two. So that's Ann's area and uh, Susan's area. So we have we have a map and we welcome you to reach out to any board member if you'd like to know how to serve on our budget committee. We, we appreciate all those that step up and, and help us out with that. So, so thank you very much for that update. Next, we have a special guest with us, um, very important committee to us, our bond accountability committee. We have the uh, outgoing chair, uh, 
Dick Herbert, who is going to join us tonight to give us an update on the bond accountability. Thank you very much. Good evening, chair and board. Uh, as the outgoing chairman of the Bond Accountability Committee, I will present the, the uh, BAC report for the past two quarters, that is uh, between April and September of uh, 2020. During this time, we held uh, three meetings, uh, two scheduled meetings and one ad hoc meeting. Uh, we did not have any site visits during this time. However, last week we did tour the ACMA renovation project, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, the meetings involved uh, presentations by the staff. Uh, board member uh, Eric Simpson uh, participated in each of the meetings, and, and uh, Brian uh, began working with us at the last meeting, and we certainly appreciate their involvement. Uh, during the uh, April uh, BAC ad hoc meeting, the staff indicated that they had forecast uh, $12 million in program reserve at completion. The staff uh, presented a list of candidate projects uh, for use of these funds, that is with the, the school board's approval. Uh, the projects were ranked uh, based on uh, a point system uh, using the criteria of safety and, and security, uh, operational impact, and community. After a discussion, the BAC agreed to recommend this to the board. Uh, significantly, the uh, BAC has added three new qualified members, uh, bringing us to full force again. Uh, they are Prashant uh, Kokami, uh, David Ramos and Brad Wright. Uh, we appreciate their interest and fresh perspective. And it was certainly demonstrated in our last questions by in our last meeting by the number of questions that they asked. Uh, also, Brian Kennedy was unanimously elected as the new chair of the BAC, uh, starting with our meeting uh, later this week, Thursday. Uh, I believe you know Brian and, and I think he, he is watching in and will be reporting to you in the future. Bottom line, uh, the committee members uh, agreed that the bond revenues are being used uh, for intended purposes based on the information that's provided by the staff to the committee in the bond program status reports. We agreed that the bond program and the school board's goals uh, were met by the staff during the past two quarters and the projects remain within established budgets. Also at the end of August, the minority women uh, and service disabled veteran owned enterprises goals uh, were exceeded by both the contractors and the consultants. With regard to uh, innovative practices that achieve reduction in long-term maintenance and construction costs, the staff made a presentation at our May uh, meeting. They provided a number of examples uh, for improving efficiency. Uh, those included uh, designing into the facilities additional conduits and raceways. Uh, this is for better uh, and easier maintenance, uh, and also if there are revisions needing to, to add uh, electrical or piping, uh, there's space for it and it goes in easier. Also, the design selected uh, wall and floor finishes uh, that are easier to maintain. Uh, they also used a new technology, the LED lighting and controls, which will reduce energy costs for those facilities. And uh, the new facilities have incorporated energy efficient HVAC systems, which uh, will also reduce costs. Uh, they also designed in better access uh, for both high places and equipment, which will help uh, on maintenance. Uh, 
the procurement strategy, which I believe you all are aware of and have been monitoring over the past few months of, I mean, past few years of using replicate designs uh, provided significant savings uh, and uh, schedule issues. Finally, uh, the implementation of the facility condition assessment uh, by the staff uh, and this was presented to the board about six months ago. Uh, Josh Gamis uh, presented this. The board feels that it is a notable innovative practice and is going to result in future significant improvements uh, for both cost and efficiency, um, as well as uh, uh, facility longevity. So the staff continues to use uh, a number of means to communicate uh, information about the, the bond program to the district stakeholders. Um, with maybe the exception of the uh, last newsletter uh, is dated, that's online is dated uh, fall of 2019, but I'm assured that the district is in the process of updating this newsletter and it will be online uh, by mid-November. Uh, the BAC continues to be satisfied uh, with the information presented and on uh, cost and schedule performance uh, of bond projects. So as, as we go into the final two years of, of 2014 bond projects, uh, the last two major school renovation projects are well underway. The Five Oaks uh, Middle School renovation is substantially complete. And after working uh, construction side by side with little kids and the occupied school, uh, the final work progress was substantially helped uh, by an empty school building. One of those silver linings to the situation that we are in. Uh, there is an outstanding uh, contractor claim of about $60,000 on that project for additional uh, pre-construction costs, but the project team is working to mitigate this. It, it should be noted that uh, there remains a positive contingency balance on this project. Uh, ACMA, the Arts and Community uh, Magnet Academy renovation, uh, made substantial progress. I was there just prior to the uh, COVID shutdown about six months ago and saw the superstructure going up. Uh, going last week, uh, it was a totally different project. Uh, the new building wing has closed, the roofing complete. Uh, they are installing, in fact, may have completed the wall panels on the east side. Uh, Current interior works included uh, the uh, concrete polishing, painting, uh, installing insulation and drywall, uh, ceiling grids, uh, cabinet work, and audiovisual wiring. The net contingency balance remains positive on this project. And, and I should say that this is an, an impressive school facility and is really going to serve the students with strong interests in theater, music, dance, and visual arts uh, very well uh, with band rooms, uh, dance studios, uh, recording equipment and classrooms. Uh, this facility uh, will be finished early and ready for the occupants in the fall. In fact, the comment I made to Carl during the walkout is, or during the walk around was, uh, how lucky those uh, kids are going to be with that facility. Uh, seismic upgrades at uh, Loa High School and uh, Beaver Acres Elementary School uh, are progressing well. Um, also, the uh, part of the summer 2020 projects included new roofs and HVA systems at Highland Park and Whitford Middle Schools. Uh, and at Barnes and Raleigh Park Elementary Schools. So a lot of work is still going on. Uh, there is minor remodel work uh, being completed throughout the district, ranging from uh, clock replacements to interior classroom lock replacements to auditorium upgrades. 
Uh, from a schedule watch list uh, issue, the central office maintenance facility renovation uh, and stormwater drainage work, which includes an expanding uh, parking, uh, that is to alleviate overflow parking in the surrounding neighborhoods, has encountered an issue and uh, will have a one year delay in completion due to addressing a wetlands issue. Uh, however, there is no impact on classes or students uh, whenever we get started on that uh, in the meantime. Uh, during the COVID-19 situation, uh, construction has proceeded, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, on the 2014 bond work. Uh, with good and safe uh, participation by the contractors, as we went through uh, ACMA, we noticed that the contractors were wearing masks and gloves. Uh, we were told that their work is scheduled for various areas, areas and times to uh, uh, try to get some social distancing in their work. Uh, the staff is remote, working remotely, uh, only going to the site when they have to, and they're keeping uh, project management efforts moving forward. Uh, there are some schedule adjustments. For example, the uh, Raleigh Park, uh, which is the school right across the street from where I live, uh, is uh, having a uh, delay for its HVAC and electrical equipment uh, uh, due to COVID related uh, factory delays. Uh, and uh, they are on the watch list for that. So let me conclude. Uh, by saying that the committee finds that based on the information received, the program is in compliance with the purposes set forth uh, in the information about the program and it was provided to the voters in advance of the 2014 election. With that, I'm open uh, to any questions. What a wonderful report <clears throat> that was unbelievable thank you so much for the dedication and the work by the whole committee but especially you dick for uh that was that was really well done thank you so much board members do you have any questions um, i wanted to thank dick for a uh, really good leadership of the uh bond you know accountability committee um we knew you had a lot of amazing construction experience with dick and you've done a great job of asking questions and um i'm really happy you're staying with the the, the group now for the next couple of years as we uh, finish off the the project so thank you for your service and continued service Oh, thank you, Eric. Any other and, questions or comments? And I am staying on. We, we love to hear that. <laughs> we love to hear that. So experience is great. So, um, so. I'll, I'll echo just a, a, le a few things that Dick said. Uh, one is the new committee members really have brought an amazing amount of knowledge. Uh, we Beaverton continues mm -hmm. to be well served by volunteers. Uh, with industry specific expertise that they're willing to share. And I'm very grateful for, for that, uh, that they are, are willing to do so and actively engaged in this committee. Um, I'm sure Dick's leadership is very helpful in helping them get on board and understand what the committee's purpose is. And it was uh, really refreshing and wonderful to see them there. Um, I know uh, board members have visited ACMA, but you know the old version, uh, I did also had the privilege of uh, joining the, the new ACMA and uh, I am very eager for school to get back open generally and uh, students at ACMA have every reason to be thrilled. Uh, it is really a state of the art facility that is gonna uh, enable their learning in ways that they could not imagine. Everything from the science classrooms to the video production areas was really top notch and uh, particularly uh, in contrast to the portable farms, Quonset hut and uh, elementary school drinking fountains that were in the old facility, it, it's really transformational uh, to provide a learning experience that they deserve. That is great. Well, we are extremely fortunate in Beaverton that we have um, a community that believes in investing in our community and investing in our schools and provided us this very, very supportive uh, 
capital bond and that we have a group of folks that are helping us make sure that we're spending that money wisely and it is being used to the best benefit to our students. And I'm extremely grateful to uh, our community and to our taxpayers and, and to those uh, on the bond accountability that are helping us make sure that this is all happening uh, and that we are doing it in the way that the, our voters intended it to happen. So thank you very much for, for that update. But I'd like to also just inject that uh, I appreciate the support from the staff. They've been terrific in uh, helping us do our job. Thank you, guys. Hey, Becky, one more note on that, too. Um, Josh and Aaron did a really nice job of like a training session for like an hour with um, the three new members. And I think that really enabled these new members to really start punching right away and like, you know, digging into the details. So they felt empowered from that training session. And I sat and I listened to it too, and it was really good. So I think these new members are going to be a fantastic addition. So. And again, we're just really fortunate to have the best of the best as far as staffing goes and project management teams. And we're, we're just very fortunate here in Beaverton. So great, great team effort. So uh, now turning topics, we are going to uh, what's on everyone's mind, uh, a return to school update, Deputy Superintendent Hansman and Dr. Sika. Okay. Good evening, Board Chair Timchuk, Board Members, and Superintendent Grady. We are really happy to be with you tonight. Um, we have just a few less team members and maybe a little bit shorter than usual um, for this evening's report. So we are here again to give you an update on return to school. Um, each month, we have come to you with our successes and our challenges regarding distance learning. Our team has continued to plan and implement comprehensive distance learning since March, and our entire teaching and learning department has been integral in this process. As you know, we will be staying in comprehensive distance learning through the end of this first semester. Teaching and learning executive administrators, CIA administrators, teachers on special assignment, classified and certified staff are all supporting this work as a team. Our team meets weekly to discuss and develop plans regarding this, the distance learning. And we have also many other teams throughout the district working on this planning. We continue to seek the input and feedback of all of our central office departments, building administrators, teachers, community, and support staff through surveys and committees. And believe it or not, we're about in our seventh week of school at this point. And our teachers and staff are doing amazing work, as you know, with our students. We are finding that staying the course is very important right now. And as you know, our staff and teachers are working harder than they have ever had to, to work in order to bring the very best to our students. It is taking a great deal of resilience and perseverance to stay focused through all the different pivots that we are enduring. We continue to maneuver and make changes by being thoughtful and intentional while making sure we are keeping our staff, students, community in mind and safe. So just as a reminder, our team, our TNL team is focused on four priorities, anti-racism leadership, comprehensive distance learning, consistent curriculum and instruction and meaningful feedback. And also as another reminder with all of the decisions we're making right now, as you know, are many. We also make sure that we use our equity lens in all of these decisions. And we take into account first, whose voice is and isn't represented in these decisions. Who does the decision benefit or burden? Is this decision in line with the BSD equity policy? And does the decision close or widen the access opportunity and expectation gap? All of these questions are used throughout our planning purposes um, for the entire comprehensive distance learning planning and updates. Um, Brian Sika, again, is with us tonight. For, he is our administrator for secondary curriculum instruction and assessment. And he is going to be updating us on comprehensive distance learning, the attendance data that we've been gathering, school reopening guidelines, and limited in-person instruction planning and timeline. And so we're happy that he is leading this work with our TNL team and with the, the district. So Brian, you can go ahead and take it away. Uh, thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Board Chair Timchuk, uh, Superintendent Grady, members of the board. 
and um, everyone listening tonight. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to update the board and update our community on some of our current thinking. Really, this comes in the area of three sort of big topics that I'll be going over tonight. A little bit of reflection on where we are with CDL with regards specifically to attendance. Some specifics around our county and uh, adjacent county metrics regard to the community spread of COVID-19 as they relate to school reopening plans and metrics. And then some specificity on limited in-person instruction. Um, I'm gonna try to be very clear, um, try to use as precise language as I can to hopefully eliminate any kind of confusion on the varying instructional models that are out there. Um, happy to answer questions at any time and certainly we'll leave time um, at the uh, end of our agenda here for questions as well. So with that, I'm gonna jump right in and I just wanna update and remind the board that we actually do have two modes of instruction occurring right now. The vast, vast, vast majority, well over 99% of our student interactions right now are in comprehensive distance learning. And so that's you know what, what similar to what we're experiencing right now where students are engaging in learning five days a week. St teachers are using consistent tools to interact with students. Um, students will have that live or you know sometimes referred to as synchronous interaction at least once per day. Um, and then we will be awarding grades and then credits as appropriate at the level. There is another method of instruction or method of interaction allowed by the Department of Education that we'll talk about in quite a bit of detail tonight known as limited in-person instruction. We do actually have a very small amount of limited in-person instruction occurring right now. And that's coming in the forms of evaluations. So when students need specific um, you, you know, tests or evaluations done based on the programs that they're receiving services for, that may be special education, multilingual or um, talented and gifted programs, they are able to come on site and um, you know, complete that assessment in a safe way. And then that, that um, you know, information is used to further service them in that program. That's the only in-person instruction that is occurring right now, but it is what we're referring to as our phase one of limited in-person instruction, albeit of course, that's a very, very small group of students and is happening infrequently. But just wanted to make sure you're clear when we say phase one of limited in-person, that is what we are um, discussing or dealing with. So a little bit about attendance and we're gonna speak to some of the challenges that um, our BA president, President Schmidt spoke to earlier. When we look at the surface, we look at um, average daily attendance for students. So that's just the number of times that they have been you know, counted present in a, for a full day, you know, divided by the number of school days that they've been registered for. And if we look at look at that, our attendance numbers are actually quite high relative to where they've been in years past, or certainly equal to is where they've been in years past. You can see in the screen we have an overall attendance rate. Um, of, of about 95% with our elementary schools upwards of 97%, middle schools around 92, and high schools and option schools around 95. Um, that doesn't really paint the entire picture of attendance. Um, there are certainly some concerns that we have in attendance. And another way to look at that, in, in years past, um, we, we've talked about chronic absenteeism, and we've talked about uh, how we want to see students having at least 90% attendance. And, and by some regards, sometimes we even think about that number of, of that chronic absenteeism being closer to, we really want to see that 94%. But a metric that we have looked about quite, quite often is the, the percentage of students that have that 90% attendance or above. And if I look at, um, you know, if we look at that number, it doesn't paint quite as, uh, I, I guess, appealing of a picture. It certainly causes us to need to dig deep and need to be reaching out to some students and families to understand what's going on with their current situation. Um, if we look at our elementary and K-8 schools, about 92% of those students have at least a 90% daily attendance rate or higher. To give you some context, that's not far off from last year. If you look at all the schools and all the grades, it's, it's fairly close to where we had been at this time last year. It's the concern comes when we talk about our secondary students and our secondary students, um, as you can see on the screen, about 84% of our secondary students have an attendance rate at 90% or above. 
And that is concerning because that is down between five and, and, and 10% from where we were at the same point last year. I think there's a, a number of factors that, that go into that. Um, one being that we just simply know that not all of our students are able to access comprehensive distance learning, whether in a technical manner or whether just simply due to the circumstances that they're navigating and the responsibilities that, that they do have. Um, positively towards that or an action towards that is we do have our site-based behavioral health and wellness teams that are using attendance data as well as a, a you know a variety of, of other site-based indicators and school-based indicators to really make those connections with families and understand how we can help to remove barriers and how we can help to engage them in distance learning. It's been widely said tonight, distance learning will be our primary mode of instruction, certainly through um, first semester. Um, as we continue to um, navigate this pandemic. So I want to talk a little bit, this slide is actually just a copy of the one that I showed last, last um, meeting, but I think it's important for us to remember what our requirements are if we were to shift to any kind of significant in-person instruction. So where I have highlighted in order to reopen under RSSL one through three, remember RSSL is just the acronym for Ready School Safe Learners, and that's the joint guidance between the Oregon Health Authority and the Oregon Department of Education. The Where I have the one through three, that's just designating the first three sections of that document that talk about significant health and safety protocols that need to be in place prior to any type of in-person instruction happening. So sometimes um, we forget to mention that and we think that just when we meet the metrics, we'll be back and it'll look just like it did you know, prior to March of, of the previous school year. And what we need to remind ourselves and remind our community of is when we do meet the metrics that are given to us by the state and by our local health authorities, we will be meeting those um, health and safety requ requirements of sections one through three. And really again, just, Briefly, what they cover is there's significant cleaning and disinfecting requirements. So the amount of um, the, the methods and the ways that are our, our key touch points in classrooms and in, in campus space throughout the campus need to be cleaned and disinfected. There's significant distancing requirements. So you we have to allocate 35 square feet for every individual to allow them to stay six feet apart from one another. Again, those social distancing guidelines that we've been given. There's significant um, requirements around cohorting of students. And just a reminder that that stable cohort it, are the students, um, students and staff that, are, that can be expected to stay within contact with one another for a somewhat extended period of time. So a, a cohort would not include students who you may just cross in the halls, but a cohort would include those students say in your first period math class or, or whatever. So, where we're at now, and this is really important because where we're at now in the next two slides, what I'm gonna talk about are our current metrics from Oregon Health Authority and from the Department of Education and the governor's office. Um, referencing what Superintendent Grodin said, we know that the governor has publicly stated a goal of hers is to have students return to in-person instruction. And she's committed to looking at the metrics and, and reevaluating the metrics. Um, for the staff here in the school district, for the community, for the board, that's when those are released and when we have a better understanding of any shifts that the governor or any of our departments make, we will certainly update the board, we'll update our staff and we'll plan accordingly. But where we're at right now and the metrics that we fall under, in order to implement in-person instruction in a significant way, so with a larger group of students, we would need to have in Washington and Multnomah counties a test positivity rate, new cases of less than 10 per 100,000 in a given week for grades four through 12. The exception to that is we could have 30 cases per 100,000 residents and bring back a significant number of our pre-K pre through three students the number of students that we could bring back would be limited by how many we could bring back and still meet the safety requirements. That, that essentially would be the limiting factor and it would occur in, in some sort of a hybrid model. There's also requirements around the state's test positivity rate, though um, there's been some pausing of that data and a, a little bit of um, 
discussion at the local health authorities, particularly in Multnomah County, just due to some of the impacts that the fires of early September had. So my next slide is just going to show you, and, and I'm just going to forewarn you and, and the entire YouTube world right now that th these metrics are not where we want to be for the health and safety of our community, nor for bringing our students back into the schools under the model that we are currently working under. So I just want to center what those colors are, and I, I hope the colors are coming through on your screens as well as they are on mine. The gray line, which for the majority of this chart is at the top, that's the number of weekly new cases. So the add up Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, add all those up and um, compare that to 100,000 residents. So Multnomah County has something like 860,000. Washington County has something like 660,000 residents. So these are the number of cases per 100,000 residents um, measured weekly. So the gray line is Multnomah County and the blue line is Washington County. Before we look too closely at the numbers, I'd like to ask you to look at the orange line that's running horizontally with that's the, the 30 mark. If we were to fall below that line, so below is where we want to be on this graph. If we were to fall below the orange line, we would be able for three weeks in a row, we would be able to begin our implementation of some sort of a hybrid model. So that would be when we're talking about a significant number of students coming back. Um, if you could draw your attention to the, I guess, yellow line with the tens on it, we would need to be below the tens for, for both that blue and gray line for both Multnomah and Washington County. We would need to be below the 10 for three consecutive weeks to bring our students back in grades four through 12 in a significant, in a, in, with a significant number in a hybrid model. Um, I, I think it's obvious we're, we're really nowhere near the opportunity of planning for that, for at least for the you know, realistic implementation of that anytime soon. And like we've updated the board, we've been clear to, to our community that that won't happen any before the um, end of the first semester. And as we can see, we have work to do as a community to um, get these metrics to, to change and, and hopefully head the other direction. Um, as we learn more about this virus, and we, I, I think I'm speaking collectively as, as a state, but as the governor as the Department of Education and the health authority, um, you know, begin to speak to us and give us further guidance, we'll certainly adjust to it. But taking this in mind, where we're at currently with the metrics, I'm going to spend the rest of my time for the presentation talking about limited in-person instruction. Limited in-person instruction is different than a hybrid in the amount of students you can bring on site at any one time. It's different in what kind of um, activities you can engage them in. And it's different in the requirements that have to be met by COVID-19 metrics in order for it, that to happen. So based on what we currently have, we are our only opportunity for on-campus instruction or on-campus interaction is limited in-person instruction. Um, I think if, if you think about limited in-person instruction, as the word says, as being truly limited, you can understand why there's no widespread COVID-19 metrics that must be met, such as the 30 cases per 100,000. What must be met for limited in-person instruction is the school that is offering the um, services, whatever it kind of looks like. And I'll explain that in a little more detail in a second. But that site cannot have any positive cases positive test cases of COVID-19 for staff or students in the previous 14 days. So that's a, it's, it's not a metric we've spoken about before with the hybrid learning, but it's the metric that needs to be met for limited in-person instruction to be initiated. Along with that, we can't forget about the requirements of Ready School Safe Learners, uh, you know, chapters one through three. We still have to be um, able to meet all the requirements of the health and safety protocols, and we still have to um, complete and submit to the Department of Education and the local health authorities the operational blueprint for reentry. So 
Again, we're offering a very, very small amount of limited in-person instruction now in the form of evaluation. So really that would be for particular students really for you know, a short amount of time. We're looking to increase that, but to increase that, there's three important, I guess, restrictions or three important um, kind of thresholds that we're not allowed to exceed when we think about offering limited in-person instruction. The cohort size for a group of students has to be 10 or less. So you can't have students in any groups larger than 10. Um, students can only be on our campus for two hours a day. And we're gonna speak to that specifically tonight when we talk about our um, internet cafe style or our attempt to increase internet access for students. And then finally, when we talk about students being in multiple cohorts, say they would come onto campus for two different reasons, students can only um, interact with two different cohorts over the course of a week. So th there's significant limitations on what and how many students we can have on campus at any one time or really as any part of this program. So when we talk about limited in-person instruction, I think the term instruction actually causes some confusion for people. And it, it certainly is one that I think is worth elaborating on. When we talk about instruction, it does not have to look like traditional instruction. In fact, um, like, like Don had mentioned, Wi-Fi access falls under that category of limited in-person instruction. That's a benefit for us because it allows us to offer access to, to internet using our resources that we know our students need. However, the challenges become those numbers of students and the amount of time that they can stay on campus for. Um, providing social emotional support, providing academic support and connections to school campus and culture are ones that can also be allowed by limited in-person instruction. So what we're doing right now is we're working to make sure that our sites would be able to meet all of the requirements for Ready School Safe Learners, you know, prior to and with, with any implementation of specific limited in-person models. We currently have staff surveys open and community surveys open. So these surveys are just out to, you know, essentially every community member and a separate survey out to all staff, really just trying to get some basic information on um, program model and design and staff availability. You know, what would the availability of staff be? Should we be needing more in-person staff members than, than right now where the majority of our staff, in particular our teaching staff, are, are working remotely from home? We are in development of student surveys and then um, follow up, following up those student surveys with, um, with focus groups. Um, uh, Shout out to our team of student managers for taking the lead on that, but working with specific or working to develop surveys and then working to work with specific groups of students to reflect on um, their how they're um, navigating CDL and some of the barriers that hopefully could be reduced through some sort of limited in person offerings. So a little bit about the timeline, like I just said, we are collecting that feedback from our stakeholders right now. We've asked that those surveys be completed by November 3rd. Um, at the same time, we're trying to identify who the potential groups of students could be. And really the idea for trying to develop those springboard models is we need to be able to reach out to our community um, the specific students and the specific teachers that may be impacted by them and really have some more um, detailed conversations, more detailed surveys and more detailed feedback from them on, from a student perspective, will they engage in that opportunity to come onto campus? And then when, when we are able to identify the specific staff, what will their availability be? So our goal for having to the point where we can reach out to specific people is, is right around that mid-November time with an attempt at getting our first increase of limited in-person instruction happening by the end of November. A little bit of context for who it looks like those students will be as our teams have created these like rubrics of um, kind of checklists and questionnaires, if you will, on identifying those students. Um, it, it looks like many of those students are students who are receiving services from our special education department, 
um, or from our multilingual department or receiving houseless homeless services from our McKinney Vento program. Um, it looks like it could be up to um, a, a maximum of up to 450 students in this next phase, which unfortunately, if we're thinking that I, just to be clear, this is not a widespread bringing back of our students that represents those 450 students really represent about 1% of our student body are eligible or, or we could reasonably return um, throughout the district, starting with the first groups coming back in the end of November. Staff would include both licensed and certified. And just a note, um, hope this isn't too far of a tangent. Um, hopefully I can connect the dots here. That 450 does not include the Wi-Fi access we've talked about. Some of our neighboring districts, we're, we're really trying to, we're really trying to plan around that two hour time limit. And what some districts are finding that are having students on campus for Wi-Fi, since they're only able to come on for two hours at a time, it's actually interrupting their school day to the point that it's becoming a disruption. And that's, that's certainly not our goal. We want to have Wi-Fi access so that students can access their comprehensive distance learning. Um, thank you to Don for advocating to the governor's office to help us know that if we can do it safely to be able to have students accessing our Wi-Fi um, in a way that hadn't helped them complete their, um, you know, com complete their studies. You know, and again, um, looking to reach out to those students and staff by mid-November. Again, we have the springboard plans coming out and looking to begin that phase two implementation near the end of November. So um, happy to answer any questions from the board. Again, thank you for your opportunity to update you. Our teams are working very hard. We appreciate everything our teachers are doing. Appreciate the feedback our teachers and staff are giving us and just, um, Happy to answer your questions and um, happy to clarify any comments. So Brian, Susan here. Um, I met with um, one of the principals a couple of weeks ago about, you know, looking about students that have don't have access to wireless or it's difficult or it's spotty or, you know, for whatever other circumstances out there. And there was talk about collaborating with another high school and utilizing a church for Wi-Fi. Do you know if other schools are thinking about that? I mean, you know, so it's good to kind of be thinking outside of our schools if we are concerned about kids that are, are really having a difficult time accessing and because of the limited time and with other limitations, it doesn't make sense for them to be in the school. So are we as a school district working on that or is it school by school? Um, thanks, Shelly. I see Shelly unmuted, Susan. I, uh, she's taking the lead on this project. So Shelly, please go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, Susan, I'd wanna let you know that uh, we have reached out to uh, faith partners uh, across the district and we've um, encouraged them to open up their facilities to allow students to come in. Um, we have several that have taken us up on that offer. And so what's happening right now are the schools that are in their general vicinity um, have made that resource um, known to students so that they can access those buildings um, you know, throughout the day or, or whenever the churches will allow them in. So that is actually um, already started. Um, and you know, given the weather, we really don't want our kids to be outside trying to access Wi-Fi. That's what they had been doing up until last week. So we're hoping to use these um, indoor spaces. It's important to note though, that there's no staff um, at those locations. Um, if they do come, they can come as volunteers. Staff can do whatever they like on their own time, um, but no paid staff is going to be manning those locations. So follow-up question in terms of, um, I don't know if the THPRD, um, Directors are open or not open, but do we have any kind of arrangement so some of our students that don't have access or limited access might be able to utilize some of the recreation centers around like THPRD? Yeah, that's I'm, a good idea. We can certainly reach out to them this week. The one, the one thing, Susan, I'm, I'm sorry, this is Don. The one thing I just want board members to be aware of is um, Number one, we really love it when our partners come out and they want to help our students also.
but for us to advocate or suggest, uh, we, we can provide the information that this is an opportunity, but that really needs to be a parent decision. Because once again, in these environments, because we do not have staff there, um, we are not monitoring social distancing requirements for folks who are offering this. So, uh, so just there, there is a, there's that whole uh, 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 liability issue there, whether it's district sponsored or non-district sponsored. Uh, that's understood. I just, you know, again, I'm so concerned about the gap we're gonna see um, with our students. So I have a, you know, another follow-up comment because I've been very involved in my uh, work uh, my, um, with the, the, I mean, the uptick in COVID is going up, it's not going down. And, you know, I realize, you know, the governor has made some very conservative decisions with the met metrics, but now we're looking at, you know, metrics are going up and we're heading into the winter time where they're expected to go even further up. So as you're having discussions with the governor about like changing the metrics, I mean, it's interesting. I'm, well, I'm going to try and filter myself here, but you know, what's her comment about COVID numbers going up? Uh, I guess that, that, that question's directed at me. Uh, that was pointed out to her in the meetings. And I think that, um, they do believe that Oregon has some of the stringent, most in her estimation, some of the most stringent uh, requirements for students returning to school. And um, I believe that is part of waiting and trying to um, get the details down uh, to look at various, whether it's communities within a county and to going up, but definitely loggerheads. And uh, there, are, there are big differences between coming back either in a hybrid or limited in-person instruction in a large school district versus a very small school district. Well, I believe that, I believe that you'll see that there are some and a, um, there are some school districts, if the metrics are adjusted, they will go back to full on instruction the next day or, or, or jet, uh, basically soon after. in larger districts, it's going to have to be a transition, um, whether it's around uh, bargaining working conditions and or finding out what staff are going to be available and not available. So okay. she's, she's, she's aware that those metrics are going up in some places, but not all places. Um, Don, I have one last comment. And again, it's because I've been focusing so much on COVID in my other life. But the other thing that has not been done in Oregon, like other states, I'm talking about California and Washington, is that we haven't tested at the same levels as other states have around us. So like our numbers aren't really, um, I don't want to say legit, but they're not real. Um, we're not seeing all the numbers that are probably out there, potentially out there, because we don't test, we don't have tests available. And I'll just uh, say that was also brought up that uh, various, in some of these states where they're seeing a lot of success there, um, they have different testing resources all the way from the efficiency, the quickness, uh, and the number of tests. So. I know that they're also, um, the governor is planning and working with other outside groups all the way from um, increasing the number of tests as well as the efficiency to all also they're looking, trying to develop a vaccination plan um, and seeing what that looks like in our state when, uh, when, when a vaccination is, is approved and ready for distribution. This is Tom. I just want to echo some of the concerns that Susan put forward about um, this decision, especially at this time when we're seeing record numbers in our state and um, the possibility of those numbers, you know, heading into a place where, depending on which projections you look at, we could be reaching like hospitalization rates that are extremely high in December. So we know that's all yet to be determined, but Oregon has been doing actually a fairly good job compared to the rest of the nation where our, our the rates have been incredibly high, especially when you compare them, you know, in a worldwide sense. 
and I'm wondering um, why at a time when our numbers are starting to increase, this would be the shift or the decision that would be being contemplated. Uh, Brian, I have a question. Um, I, I noticed uh, your keen attention to attendance details. Uh, which I really appreciate. Um, what I'm curious about um, in the world of CDL, if we're starting to be able to get any corresponding details about whether students are on track to pass their classes. Because um, I, you know, I, I do know that learning looks different, so that you could, you know, it's theoretically possible to be well engaged, but maybe be marked absent. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what kind of data we're getting about kids on track in their classroom learning. Uh, great question, and I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your understanding that CDL is significantly different and attendance data may be even less reliable of a predictor right now. Um, so th this past Friday was the halfway mark of our first quarter. And so at that point would be the requirement for all teachers to kind of have that initial progress report. So we can get that, we can pull that data and get that to a, into a board report. It, I, I don't have it yet, but um, the first shot would be available this you know, update this past Friday, so we can get that to you. Yeah, I look forward to that. Kind of in the same vein, we have been uh, sharing with uh, parents, families, um, that uh, especially at, at, the, at the elementary, uh, that we will not be doing conferences, um, that that's not something, um, is there going to be some kind of way that we are communicating uh, with our families, how they can best support their students and, and what might that look like if it's not conferences? I think, uh, I don't think we have a plan for a replacement of conferences. You know, I don't think we have a, a, a daily outreach, but I think what we can do is ensure that parents know how to access their, um, you know, on Synergy, it's called their parent view account and then access the information, specifically the elementary level, make sure that families know how to access the information that's available to them on Seesaw to keep them up to date and then also know how they can access their teachers and their, you know, administrators to schedule those appointments if necessary. And it looks like Ginny unmuted to uh, elaborate on that as well. Well, um, Brian said it well, but um, we are, elementary is working on plans for feedback for parents and um, right now are in the midst of kind of communicating that out to principals and to teachers and collaborating to find out all the ways that we can do that within Seesaw and Canvas and some of the other means. But um, because we're not having conferences, we're having to do a lot of looking at what assessments um, or what feedback is needed at this time. And that will be coming out in the next week or so. So we can update you at the same time um, next time in terms of kind of what, that, what those um, scores and feedback look like, um, both at the elementary and the secondary level. Becky, just to add a little bit to that, so I probably sat through, I don't know, uh, Jenny can help me here and count, but I think it's probably 10, 10 to a dozen elementary um, academic conferences where basically schools are presenting uh, some of their data as it relates to and on some of the informative assessments and what they're seeing as far as um, student achievement, uh, looking at attendance. But one of the silver linings in this uh, for them, it, with most of them, have been uh, the parent engagement with the teachers. That's actually been a positive and a plus, and it's been ongoing because sometimes the teacher does have to interact uh, more and has the availability on a daily basis, to, at least at the elementary level, to interact with the parents. So they've mentioned that has been an absolute uh, a plus, and it's ongoing versus waiting to a uh, waiting for a conference and whatnot. So and, and also I had the opportunity to, to speak to a couple of parent groups this last week. And it seems like one of the places, I mean there's lot, but one of the places is especially for our incoming sixth graders at the middle school and our incoming freshmen at the high school, it's it's a new place, it's a new what's required of them. And we didn't get to do the normal link crew or introduction or anything like that? Is there is there anything that we're trying to do to add support for those that are new at, at, at a school of what's expected? You know, I don't know that, non-district-wide, Becky, I think actually some of our attendance data is looking like, 
our ninth graders are actually, you know, attending a little bit more than our others. That's not to discount that those transitions are, are still there. I think our schools um, have a, just a variety of different out, outreaches. Again, they all have the behavioral health and wellness teams, but I think they also all have their teachers, their counselors, you know, reaching out and trying to respond, um, you know, respond to their kind of individual needs or individual requirements. Um, we can, uh, you know, with the freshmen and the um, sixth graders, like you mentioned, we can reach out to those schools and report back out how they're, um, how, what creative and innovative ways they're addressing the transitions. But um, to be fair to your question, that wasn't something that we um, like mandated through centrally. Thank you. Any other questions from board members on return to school? Well, that was a lot of information, uh, a lot of important information. And as board members, as we were getting ready for this meeting, I mean, this is one of the few times that literally between the time we plan the agenda, the board book comes out, we get ready for the board meeting, information is changing in between. That's how fast information is coming. So we appreciate you keeping us as up to date as well as you do. And it's a lot of information. It's a lot of information for our families to understand and comprehend. It's a lot for our staff. Uh, we're trying to do three or four things at once. We're trying to coordinate with the state. Um, we, we just need a lot of patience. We need to keep asking a lot of good questions. We need to keep communicating uh, because going forward, this isn't gonna get easier. Um, so appreciate uh, all the work out of teaching and learning and, and for the report. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Board Tim Trout, and thank you to the school board. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next up, um, we have discussion items. And the first thing on discussion items is the first reading of school board policy DFA and assistant, uh, associate, I'm sorry, associate superintendent Schofield, are you ready to go? Call me what you like, Chair Tim Chuck. That's fine. <laughs> Members of the board, appreciate the time on this. This is the first reading of uh, policy DFA, which is your investment of funds policy. Uh, within that policy, it requires uh, my review on an annual basis and any recommended changes as well as your review. Uh, this is a first reading. Uh, this policy follows the Oregon Short-Term Fund Board's uh, sample policy. It meets all the in terms of priorities, it has it straight, uh, main, maintaining our capital, uh, maintaining a liquid position, and uh, finally yield in, in third place. So uh, after my review, no suggested changes, but needed to bring it to you uh, for your review as well. Um, I don't believe the policy committee has looked at this, uh, but... Um, it didn't look like there were it, there were any changes, like you said. It was just a, a update. But uh, board members, do you have any questions uh, on on the first reading of the policy? All right. Well, we'll look forward to the the second reading. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have, as we already discussed earlier, um, the um, Student Investment Act grant agreement that we need to uh, approve as a board, uh, Dr. Bridges. I just remind the board on the situation page, the grant agreement is valid if five conditions are met and the fourth condition, well, I'll go through them. Make the grant agreement available at the main office and on the district's webpage and it's posted on, or will be posted on our district's webpage tomorrow. Share during oral presentation by an administrator at an open meeting, we did that earlier. Made available for the public to comment at an open meeting that was done with the posting of board book and the agenda and the items. And the fourth bullet is approval by the governing body of the grant recipient at an open meeting. Check, we got that. So with that, any discussion? Mm -hmm. Yep, I think it's still I, not working, Leanne. Yeah, Chair, Chair, I recommend that the board approve the student investment account grant agreement. I, I second. second. And properly moved and seconded that the board uh, agree to the student investment grant agreement. Um, I will the I will be calling the roll. If you could see, please signify by saying aye, nay, or abstain. And Leanne, if you can just give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, we'll take that. Uh, I'll I'll record your your voice vote here. Uh, and Brian, aye. 
Uh, Donna is excused. Eric Simpson? Aye. Leanne Larson? Leanne votes aye. Susan Greenberg? Aye. Susan votes aye. Vice Chair Tom Collette? Aye. Aye. And uh, Becky Timchuk votes aye. Motion passes uh, six to zero. Thank you. All right, next up, we are going to discuss the Oregon School Board Board of Directors representative election. Um, is there any discussion on our upcoming election to the OSBA board? As, as you recall, that we are uh, nominated at our last meeting, our only Ann Larson and her longtime service um, on our Oregon School Board Association board. Is there any discussion? Chair, just, sir, oh. Yep, yep, you, you go first, Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, I move that the Beaverton School District elects Leanne Larson for the OSBA Board of Director position number 15. And I would add that I um, know that Leanne will do an amazing job for us, and I appreciate all of her years of doing amazing work for us at OSBA. That's great. Do I have a second? I second. All right. Well, it's been properly moved and seconded that we elect Leanne Larson to serve on uh, position number 15 on the OSBA uh, Board of Directors. Uh, we'll call the roll, signify by saying aye, nay, or abstain. Anne Bryan? Aye. Donna Tyner is excused. Eric Simpson? Aye. Leanne Larson? Leanne Larson votes aye. Susan Greenberg? Aye. Vice Chair Tom Collette? Aye. Becky Timchuk, aye. Motion passes six to zero. Congratulations, Leanne. We know you're going to do a great job representing us at OSBA. Uh, is there any other business? Uh, Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda. It's been moved. <laughs> Anybody like to second? I second. Good. It's been moved and seconded that we <laughs> approve the consent agenda. We will call the roll. Is there any discussion? We'll call the roll. Signify by saying aye, nay, or abstain. Anne Bryan? Aye. Donna Tyner is excused. Eric Simpson? Aye. Leanne Larson? Leanne Larson votes aye. Susan Greenberg? Aye. Susan votes aye. Vice Chair Tom Collette? Aye. And uh, Becky Timchuk votes aye. Motion passes to... Uh, Approve the consent agenda six to zero. That was almost like taking a Supreme Court election there. Didn't it feel like that? <laughs> All right, with that, uh, is there any board communication tonight? I, 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 I'm gonna just quickly say something. Um, one, I wanna congratulate Leanne and thank her for um, her hard work with OSBA and, and you know, to, to, to work so hard on the Student Success Act you know, which sadly is not fully funded right now. But I wanted to comment about the fact that in the last couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to Zoom with um, all but one of our principals to kind of get a feel for what's going on in their schools and with their teachers and with their students. Um, and it'd be what you'd expect, kind of what we've heard from, you know, report out by teaching and learning, but you know, principals are very much concerned about their teachers and their mental health. And I just wanted to kind of bring it to everybody's attention. Um, also, of course, concerned about students and, you know, how uh, CDL is working for them. But I mean, I have to say that, you know, with that said, principals were very pleased with, in the circumstances that we're in, how things are going. Very good. Any other board comments? Um, I will say I had the uh, opportunity to uh, participate in a early learning with all of our elementary principals and the enthusiasm for early learning and um, the dedication to our staff to early learning and the importance of play and our partnership with the Children's Institute. It's, it's all very rewarding in a time when we're seems like we're having to make so many sacrifices on different things. It, it's, it's very rewarding to see that we are still able to dedicate ourselves to something that we feel so strongly as a board and as a district uh, with, with early learning. So um, th that was very positive. 
and um, also um, want to take the opportunity of someone in our finance department, Jessica Jones, who's been a great you know, support when we put together our budget and all of our finance meetings. Um, she was certified um, and uh, in her uh, area of expertise and that this has taken her a couple of years and I just wanna uh, recognize her effort for getting that done in a di very difficult time that we, we have uh, such great personnel that, that are dedicated to their profession and, and support and supporting us uh, there. And then lastly, uh, on a personal note, I was able to participate in the uh, Southridge um, Memorial game. And of course there is, there is no sports right now, but something that's been uh, dedicated since 2012 or recognizing our veterans and recognizing one of our own students that we lost, uh, Andrew Keller. Um, and it was just a, a, a very small moving with, with the family, just a small group, um, but it was just a great way to recognize the importance of community and, um, and just the importance, no matter what we're, we're all going through, that we're, that we're here to support one another and support our veterans and um, support those that give so much to, to, to our school district. So it was, a, it was a great thing to be able to particip participate in that. And um, Leanne here, for those that uh, can't read, wants to uh, everybody to know that the OSBA board is going to meet with the governor tomorrow about entering back into class and the COVID metrics and um, school board members will be giving input to her. So if you want Leanne to make sure to speak on, on your opinion, on your behalf, let Leanne know tonight. And then lastly, I wanna remind uh, everyone that tomorrow we have our WE Community Partnership um, and we're gonna be recognizing the great accomplishments of, uh, from last year and, and going over to this year. And I encourage board members to, to participate in our partnership breakfast and um, all of our schools and, and to be reaching out to our schools because these partnerships are more important than ever. So I uh, look forward to having you folks all participate in that. And our next meeting will be a work session on November 16th. Uh, it'll be at 6.30 and the focus of that work session We'll be talking about um, our partnership with SROs, campus supervisors, and um, and and what that partnership looks like uh, going forward. So uh, I'll look forward to seeing you all at our work session on November 16th. And uh, with that, Superintendent Grouding, do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, just uh, exciting. Uh, tomorrow at five o'clock, uh, we'll be having uh, our first equity summit in which all schools. Um, or most schools uh, have selected equity teams. And a lot of those teams are made up of our BIPOC staff and they will be um, participating in their first equity summit. So big shout out to our BMAC, BMAC organization, shout out to Pat McCreary and, and several others that have just been great in putting this together. So we're really excited about that. That takes place from, I believe it's from five to six tomorrow. So. Uh, actually, it's on Wednesday. Uh, I'm just saying it's on Wednesday from 1 to 3.30. So I'm looking in my calendar and it says it's from 5 to 6. So probably you as your error, but Pat just text me and I don't know, Pat, can you unmute yourself and do you want to come in and just add to that to make sure I'm not messing up? Sure thing, Don. Sorry about that. Uh, it is on Wednesday from 1 to 3.30. It's during our professional learning time. We're very excited about it. We're meeting tomorrow night from 5 to 6 to oh, okay. uh, do a run through. All right. So you, okay. you weren't wrong. We've got multiple meetings mixed up. Okay. All right. With that, uh, board members, it's 8.30. We gained a half an hour that I'm sure we'll bank at a later date. So thank you everyone for being here tonight and uh, for your patience and we will uh, see you in a couple of weeks and with that we're adjourned.